Let me teach you about the Newton-Raphson formula, or sometimes this is called Newton's method. It's really just a kind of cool and intuitive way of getting increasingly more accurate estimates of the zero of a function. Um, it doesn't always work, but when multiple iterations through the process start to converge on a value, that value is a good estimate of one of the zeros of the function. Now, before I tell you about the steps to Newton's method, these three steps here, before I tell you about them in more detail, I just want to uh, give you a general idea of how this works using the graph of a function that we should be familiar with. So you'll notice here, I've got the graph of y equals negative x squared plus four. We know the graph of that, and we actually know where the zeros of that function are. The zeros are at two and negative two. But we're gonna pretend we didn't know those are the zeros of this function and see how Newton's method could approximate those zeros for us. And I'm gonna do that by zooming in on this section of the graph right here, just over here. Now, Newton's method, like I said, there's three steps to it. In general, the three steps, uh, step one tells us basically we make a guess for one of the zeros. And then step two says, we follow a formula, which I see right here, that will calculate another approximation for us based on our first approximation. And then if that new approximation is close enough to our previous approximation, then we say that we have a good estimate for the zero. If it's not close enough, then we perform the process again. Before we get into more detail about that formula that's right here, let me just show you on this graph how that general process works. So if you remember step one said, you start off by making an initial guess where a zero for the function is. But let's say we didn't know a zero of this function was at two. We had no idea there was a real zero right there at two. And we guessed that a zero of the function was 0.5. We call that our first approximation. Now the function actually isn't at zero at my x value 0.5. Where is it? It's up here, uh, a little less than four. Now what we do, is we find out where does a tangent line that touches the function at that point, where does that tangent line intersect the x-axis? So let me draw a tangent to the function at an x value of 0.5. Now that's not a perfect tangent line, but I think that does good enough for our example here. That tangent line intersects the x-axis right here, somewhere between two and a half and three. Now that is not a zero of the function, but Notice that my second x value, my second approximation, its distance from the actual zero, which I've highlighted in yellow, is a lot closer than the distance the initial approximation was from the x-axis, which I've highlighted in green. And the more we repeat this process, the closer the approximations are going to get to the actual zero. Watch, if I repeat this process again, at my second approximation, find where the function actually is, it's about right here. If I draw a tangent line to the function at that point, notice that where that tangent line intersects the x-axis, I'll call that my third approximation, x3, is actually really close to the actual zero of the function. Its distance from the actual zero is only that little bit right here. And if we repeated this process again, let me just zoom in as far as I can here and show you if I find where the function is at the x value of my third approximation. And then if I were to draw a tangent line to the function there, notice it's going to be very close to the actual zero of the function. And that would be my fourth approximation. So how many times do you repeat this process? Well, it's actually up to you how accurate you want your guess to be. But generally what we do is we stop once the distance between consecutive approximations so the distance example between x3 and x2 um, may not be close enough for the accuracy you desire. So then you perform it again and then check the distance between your fourth and third approximation. As the distance between your approximations gets smaller, that means that you are converging in on the actual zero. So you can set a limit for what you want the distance between your approximations to be. And once you've reached that limit, you can use that as your approximation for the zero. Another thing I wanna point out is why does the tangent line provide a good approximation for where the zero of a function is? Well, if we look at the tangent line at the x value of our first guess, notice 
it generally represents the direction the function is going. But obviously the function does curve away from that tangent line a little bit. And as we narrow in to the actual zero of the function, it has less room to curve away. So we know that the tangent line is zoning in on where the true zero of the function is. So now that I've shown you this general idea of how this works, I want to show you about this formula, this formula that is actually going to calculate these approximations, these x2, x3, x4 values. So let me show you that using this same graph of negative x squared plus four, let's figure out after you choose your x1 value, after you choose your initial guess, how are we going to calculate where the second guess is? Well, remember the second guess is going to be where the tangent line intersects the x-axis right here. There's going to be my second guess. How are we going to calculate that second guess? Well, we're going to use our knowledge of calculus and of basic slope principles. So I'm going to label these two points I have. This green point at my second guess, it's on the x-axis, so that's the point x2, comma, 0. And this blue point up here is at my first guess, and its y value is just the value of the function at my first guess, at x sub 1. Now, if I were to describe the slope of this blue tangent line, I could do it a couple different ways. Hopefully you remember what a derivative is. A derivative tells you the slope of a function at a point. So if I found f prime at x1, that would tell me the slope of that blue tangent line. But another way I could calculate the slope of that blue tangent line, since I know the coordinates of two points on that tangent line, right? I know this point and this point, I could use my general idea that slope is change in y over change in x. So f prime at x sub 1 is equal to, well, my change in y, if I look at the y coordinates of the points and then find the difference in them, I would do f at x1 minus 0. That's the difference in the y values. And I could visualize that by looking at the rise of the function there. The height of the triangle that I have here is just whatever the value of f at x1 is. And my change in x, if I look at the x values of the points, x1 minus x2 will tell me the difference in the x values. So x1 minus x2. And I can visualize that. That's the run of the function. That's the distance here. That's my change in x, which I can calculate by doing x1 minus x2. And notice I did x1 minus x2 instead of the other way around, because in the numerator, when I did change in y, I did the y value of that point minus that one. So I have to follow that same order for x's, that one minus that one. Now let's just rearrange this formula. I want to isolate x2. My goal is to figure out a formula that will find x2 for me. It'll find my second approximation. So let's take this whole denominator and multiply it over to the left side. So I would have the difference in the x values times f prime of x1 equals f at x1. And I want to isolate x2, so I'm going to divide f prime of x1 to the other side. So I have my difference in my x values equals f at x1 over f prime at x1. And then isolate x2, uh, leave x1 on the left, bring over the quotient, and that's equal to x2, my second approximation. There is the newton raphson formula. That formula allows you to calculate a second approximation by using your first approximation and the function value and the value of the derivative of that value. We could generalize this formula and say that instead of x1 and x2, we could make a general notation for this. So x1, I could just call that xn, and then minus f at xn over f prime of x sub n equals, and then notice the relationship between that value and that value. Uh, the formula finds us the next approximation, or approximation n plus 1. So this is the generalized formula for calculating an approximate guess using Newton's method.
Let's use that formula to evaluate example one. Example one says approximate a zero of f at x equals x squared minus two. We'll perform three iterations of the process and then we'll check how accurate the answer is after going through the process three times. Now, x squared minus two, uh, I actually know quite a bit about this function. I know generally what it looks like. x squared minus two uh, is an x squared function moved down two. And I know it has zeros actually at root two and negative root two. We're, we'll pretend we don't know that much information about it. And we're just going to guess a zero of the function. So we don't know what the value of root two is exactly. I know it's, you know, it's bigger than one, but it's less than two. So we can use Newton's method to get a good approximate value of what root two is. So this is actually a cool method that can evaluate square roots for us, or at least get us really close approximations. So let's say we didn't know the value of root two at all, and we made our first guess of root two being exactly one. Now I know it's not exactly one, but that can be our first guess. That would be fine. We can use the newton raphson formula, which actually, let me rewrite it here so you can remember. It says to get an approximation, we take the previous approximation and subtract f at that approximate value divided by f prime at that approximate value. So using that formula, let's calculate our second approximation. So x2 would equal, we take the previous approximation, which was one, and we subtract f at one over f prime at one. And we can get these values. It might be useful for me to write the equation of the derivative up here. If f at x is x squared minus two, f prime of x is just two x. So we'll do one minus f at one, well one squared minus two is negative one, over f prime at one is two. So I have one plus a half, that's 1.5 or three over two. So my second approximation, is 1.5. Let's get an even better approximation. Let's find a third approximation. We take the previous approximation, so 1.5, and we subtract f at 1.5 divided by f prime at 1.5. So this will give me 1.5, which as a fraction, I could write that as three over two, minus, if I sub 1.5 into the original function, I would get a quarter or 0.25, I'll write a quarter. And if I sub it into the derivative, I would get three. A quarter over three, that's a 12th. And then as a fraction, my answer would be for this, 18 over 12 minus one over 12 is 17 over 12. If I wanted a decimal value for this, that's about, and I'll keep a lot of decimals, 1.4. One, six, six, six repeated. So I'll end it with a seven there. I'll keep six decimal places. There's my third approximation. Notice the difference between my first approximation and my second approximation is revealed to me by this value here. It's, it's a half away. And then my difference between my second approximation and my third approximation is only a 12th away. So they're getting closer together. Let's perform one more iteration of this process. Right, it says do three iterations. We've done one, two, let's do one more iteration of the process. Let's find my fourth estimate. So the fourth estimate, I take the third approximation, set which was 17 over 12, and I subtract f at 17 over 12 divided by f prime at 17 over 12. So we would have 17 over 12 minus and then if I evaluate those two, I get one over 44 when I sub it into the original function. And I get 17 over six when I sub it into the derivative. Now I could combine those fractions together to make one over 408. So that tells me that the difference between uh, my fourth and third approximations is only going to be one 408th. So my approximations are getting really close together. And if I subtract one over 408 from 17 over 12, that would give me 577 over 408. As a decimal value, that is about 1.414216. So I kept six decimal places again. 
So I performed my third iteration through the process and noticed that these values, my estimates, 1, 1 1.5, 1.41667, 1.414216, they're converging on a value. They're converging on that root two value. So let's write down what Newton's method found for us. Newton's method just approximated root two for us. Newton's method said root two is approximately 1.414216. It's saying that's approximately where a zero of the function is. And we know there's a zero of a function at root two. Therefore, this method is telling us the approximate value of root two is this. Now, well, let me just write here Newton's method. Now, how accurate was this? Well, if you were to ask your calculator what the square root of two is, your calculator is going to say that root two is about 1.414214. So that's what your calculator would say. Look how close Newton's method got us. And if we were to perform another iteration through the process, it would get us even closer. So what's the difference here? We were only off. The error from Newton's method was only 0.000002, right? Notice the first five digits of the answers were the same, right? Notice if you look after the decimal place, the first five digits are the same. So hopefully you can see how Newton's method gets us such an accurate answer. Jensen,